Hi, I'm Andrew Seeger. And I'm Casey Candela. Before we start, we just want you to know, we'll be talking about sexual harassment in explicit terms, and some people may find it difficult to listen. Maybe you, you've heard the term or not, bare mountain compact. Oh, yes. It says, what happens in Albany stays in Albany. Toby Ann Stavisky has been in New York politics for a long time. Since 1999, she's been state senator Toby Ann Stavisky. But before that, she was Leonard Stavisky's wife. We had just been married when he was elected to the assembly, and uh, uh, he did not, you know, approve of what went on. And he saw a lot of the bad stuff because it, it's sort of like locker room talk. And uh, some of the stories he came home and told me were really embarrassing. Toby Ann and Leonard got married in 1964. Two years later, Leonard was elected to the New York State Assembly to represent a new district in Queens. He would commute up to Albany for session days, and unlike most lawmakers' wives, sometimes Toby Ann went with him. I remember we were in Albany. He was going to dinner, and uh, we didn't have cell phones in those days. So I picked up food, and I went back to the hotel to eat. And I got a phone call at the hotel. Pick me up now. So I dropped my food and went to pick him up. Apparently, the meeting was to let them know the phone number to call in Albany during the night if you wanted to see a woman. Now, we had just been married, and he was horrified. I couldn't believe the crassness. And this sort of thing was common for Very common. Albany's night scene wasn't really Leonard's thing, but many of his colleagues spent their evenings drinking, making deals, and trying to pick up women. The Democrats stayed at the Dewey Clinton. Uh, the Republicans stayed at a hotel literally almost across the street uh, called the Ten Eye. I don't know what went on at the Ten Eye, but I do know what went on at the Dewey Clinton. They would meet their friends at a bar on the, on the mezzanine floor called The Shelf. My husband used to call it the Charleston Slave Auction. And women would come by and, you know, they would just go off. And that was a disgrace. That does not happen today. But it happened for a long time. When Teddy Roosevelt was first elected to the New York State Assembly in 1882, he was shocked by what he saw. Shortly after arriving in Albany, he wrote in his diary about his fellow legislators, calling them vicious, stupid-looking scoundrels with apparently not a redeeming trait. But why did these men behave this way? What is the Bear Mountain Compact, and why did it survive for so long? Legislators in Albany have always had a lot of power and a lot of time. The unspoken agreement was... As long as everyone kept mum about what happened north of Bear Mountain, no one's wives downstate had to know a thing. Senator Stavisky admits her husband had a lot of free time in Albany, but she knew how he spent it. My husband, I must tell you, he used to take stuff back to the hotel room to read because I was raising a young child. Our child was born a few years later. So I'd be home at night. He'd be in his hotel room and we would sort of watch television together. He was bored. The advantage was we didn't have to fight over the remote, but on the mm -hmm. other hand, uh, that, that's the difference. I mean, he was very, very troubled by what went on. In fact, somebody once commented, everybody fools around, name two who don't. And one of the people who was named was my husband. Senator Stavisky believes her husband was one of the first in a new generation of lawmakers who didn't want in on Albany's nightlife. But over the decades, the cocktail of unfettered power, time to kill, and next to no accountability proved irresistible for some lawmakers. The senators come to Albany and they see this beautiful chamber and beautiful chairs and uh, some of them lose their balance. Not all of them, most of them don't. And that's very, very important. Some of them lose their view of reality. Seymour Lockman was a state senator in Albany. He served alongside Senator Stavisky in the 90s and early 2000s. Before that, he taught government and politics to college students. When he first got elected, he was shocked to see most of the legislative power in New York was held by only three men. Still, despite having little control over the budget process, lawmakers commanded power and respect from just about everyone else in Albany. 
This power showed itself in very subtle ways. When he got to Albany, he wasn't Dr. Seymour Lockman anymore. He was senator. Two security guards. We used to have a great time talking to each other. And they gave me their first names. And I said to them, please, in the future, call me Seymour. Don't call me Senator or Dr. Lackman. And then I was upbraided by a colleague who said to me, that you did something that could uh, have these guys go to jail. I said, what did I do? And he said, you told them to call you by your first name. And they're instructed by the leadership never to do that or they might lose their jobs. They have to call you senator. And I said, even if they're my friends, and I said, yes. Even though Seymour was uncomfortable with the amount of power he suddenly had, this was business as usual for Albany. Men, power, no accountability. But something changed after the 60s. By the time Toby Ann and Seymour were elected in the 90s, young women were getting internships and staffing in the Capitol. With the bad behavior that went on for so long in Albany, it was a recipe for rampant sexual harassment and assault. At that time, my daughter was a teenager. And um, most of the interns are young men and young women of college age. And uh, after I saw what was going on, I said to my wife, I would never, ever allow Sharon to become an intern in the state senate or the assembly. I went to college at uh, SUNY Albany and ultimately had an internship in the New York State Legislature for this for the state assembly. Patricia Gunning interned back in the mid-1980s. But back then it was obviously male-dominated. Um, and for interns like me, you know, there were many of us kind of floating around. And um, there were lots of alcohol-fueled events in the evenings with legislators that were paid for by lo- various lobbying groups. And for many interns like myself, it's kind of how you fed yourself, right? These alcohol-fueled events weren't too different from what went on at the DeWitt Clinton and the Ten Eyck. Instead of call girls, there were young female interns and staffers. You know, there are a lot of powerful men preying on young women, I think is the best way to to put it, um, sexually and otherwise. Um, Whether they were interns for them or just young women that ended up at these um, lobbyist-type events in the evenings. As a young woman new to Albany, you're really vulnerable. You're new in town and you're far from home. This is your first real internship or job, and you want to make good impressions. You're busy in the office during the day, and now's the time to network. Maybe you don't know anyone at the event, but you know you're surrounded by really powerful people. And it's easy to get sucked into the glitz and the glam. You know, Albany is a bubble, right? So Albany is a very unique place because... The whole city revolves around, obviously, uh, the capital and legislation and elected officials. People have an inflated sense of what's going on. So as a young person, you know, you certainly feel like you're in the middle of a very powerful arena. And certainly there are plenty of powerful men uh, taking advantage of both their power and the young women around them. Sexual harassment isn't about sex. It's about power. At these work events, young women were easy targets for men drunk on their power with no one around to keep them from using it. What I saw were and experienced were powerful men away from home, um, uh, preying on many young women, including myself. We'll hear from Patricia Gunning in a later episode about her experience of sexual harassment in Albany not as an intern, but at the height of her career. But before that, there's a lot of stories we have to get through. Stories from women and men who were swept up in Albany's culture of harassment, tried to seek justice, and met countless deliberate roadblocks along the way. The mediation ended when she said, Michael would like to apologize. He did not apologize. And it was a disaster, and I just kind of shut down, and he sat there just... Next time 
on Women in the Room, we'll hear from Elizabeth Crothers, who says she was raped by Assembly Council Michael Boxley in 2001. This week's show was reported and produced by me, Casey Candela, and Andrew Seeger, and edited by our news director, George Bodarki. Chuck Singleton is our general manager. Special thanks to Robin Shannon and the whole WFUV News team. Our music is by Poddington Bear and Teresa Broadwell. She's a Capital Region jazz singer and fiddler who actually did perform this song and the one you heard earlier at the shelf in the 1980s, where she was a regular act. Sexual harassment has been in the headlines a lot lately, and there's only so much we can include in each episode. Follow along with us on Twitter, at Prickly Podcast, for updates on advocates' efforts and new legislation. And check out our website, pricklypolitics.atavist.com. Prickly Politics is available on SoundCloud, iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, TuneIn, and Stitcher. If you find our reporting interesting and important, please rate our show and share with your friends. Straighten up and fly right. Straighten up and stay right. Straighten up and fly right. Cool down, Papa, don't you blow your top. Straighten up and fly right. Straighten up and stay right. <laughs>